Hello and welcome. My name is Michael Eagle. I'm the General and Artistic Director for Des Moines Metro Opera. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you for tonight's event as part of our 2020 virtual festival season. Uh, this is Manon Week here at Des Moines Metro Opera as we gear up for our uh, Sunday afternoon broadcast and go live of our 2016 production of Massenet's Manon. Uh, tonight's lecture is uh, part of our Director's Insight series, but there are other events leading up to the broadcast tomorrow night at 7 p.m. I hope you'll join us as we go live with Catching Up with the Cast as part of the virtual festival season. We'll get a chance to hear uh, from members of the production, uh, uh, cast members, et cetera, as they share their memories of uh, this special production. Tonight's guest uh, is not a stranger to Des Moines Metro Opera audiences. Uh, stage director Christine McIntyre has directed over nearly 100 productions across the US uh, with a primary focus on new and contemporary American works, uh, including a major co-production of Moby Dick. Uh, it's already been produced several times by companies like Utah Opera, Chicago Opera Theater, Pittsburgh Opera, uh, et cetera. I'm very proud that much of her work in contemporary uh, opera has been with us at Des Moines Metro Opera, including uh, new productions of works like uh, Dead Man Walking, Three Decembers, As One, Soldier Songs, Glory Denied, and of course, Billy Budd and Flight, uh, and who can ever forget last summer's remarkable Wozzeck. Uh, working with Christine over the course of uh, uh, almost 10 years now to, to pull together a new production, uh, each season is one of the great joys of my job and a process that I consider myself very fortunate to be in on uh, at the ground floor as we begin each production. Uh, and regardless of whether it's a contemporary opera or it's a, a, a period piece, a classic work that we're taking a fresh look at uh, and teasing out uh, just how alive some of these works can be, uh, such as La Boheme, uh, Eugene Onegin, or the subject of tonight's talk, our uh, Massenet's Manon. Uh, it's a special privilege to work with her. Our talk tonight is called, uh, entitled Undressing the 18th Century, uh, and I'm pleased to allow to, to allow you into a little peek into my world and the creativity and thought that is the hallmark of every production that Christine leads. Uh, and so without any further ado, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming tonight's special guest and speaker, Christine McIntyre. Christine. Hello, thank you so much. Welcome to Undressing the 18th Century. This is a look at the clothing and aesthetics of the 18th century and how they affected our production of Manon. Now, before we can undress the 18th century, I think it's a, useful to understand a little bit about what made it so different than what came before. So, in 1715, Louis XIV died at Versailles and that marked the end of the Baroque period. And just to look at him there, you get a sense of the seriousness, the weight, the heaviness, the gravitas that he had brought to the Baroque period. He was replaced by his great grandson, Louis XV, who became king with his uncle Philippe, who was Duke of Orleans, as regent for the first several years. Now, one thing that Philippe passed along to the, uh, the young Louis XV was a hatred of Versailles. He found it too constricting and he much preferred Paris. He preferred places like this the Palais Royal, which was a royal residence built around a large courtyard. And the courtyard was filled with cafes and shops and especially shops that were dedicated to fashion. Now this was a much more open society than that of Versailles. It was less formal, the upper classes mixed with the rising bourgeoisie class and that rising bourgeoisie class was eager for a chance to spend their new money. So a new society required a new type of design that came to be known as the Rococo. This painting, uh, lovely, called The Swing uh, by Jean-Honoré Fragonard is the perfect embodiment of the Rococo. So what do we see in this painting? Well, obviously there's a certain playfulness, a lightness and a wit to it. It's feminine, it's graceful. You get a sense of airiness from this painting, lighter fabrics, floating silks and lace, Pastels, lots of lighter colors, a lot of white and gold and, and light pinks and light blues. You can see uh, the gentleman who's uh, beneath the lady on the swing down there in the corner. He's actually wearing light blue. This was a very sensual world. Often it's referred to as a boudoir world. 
And if you look at much of the art, you get that sense. This was art that revolved largely around women, unlike the Baroque era, which had been more male-centered in its artistic focus. So suddenly you have women as kind of the aesthetic centerpiece. They are the centerpieces of fashion, of art, of style, and even French intellectual life. If you wanted to have a very elegant salon, you needed it to be run by a woman. They were the arbiters of taste and style, and their spending became a major economic force in the French economy. And soon, everything was geared toward their taste. So here, the beautiful green room that you see, furniture, fashion, everything designed to suit women. There was a synergy between the two, between furniture and fashion. Those things worked together to create beautiful, elegant spaces. To quote the catalog of the Met Museum's wonderful Dangerous Liaisons exhibit, furniture and fashion were intended to attract and ultimately to seduce. So Rococo interiors were total works of art. You can see how it's carried not even up all the way up the walls and into the ceiling here. They were gracious, light, lovely spaces. Furniture too became lighter in response and it began to take on an elegant feminine appeal. You can see almost feminine curves in the curve of the legs. The arms of the chairs actually began to curve in a way that allowed for the panniers of women's dresses. The graceful feet began to evoke the shape of women's pointed shoes. And you can even see this in the porcelain of the day. So here are a few images of Sev porcelain. You'll find this in the Met Museum collection. This is actually, most of this is from Seattle. Um, beautiful, wonderful porcelain. And again, you can see these, these pastels and these feminine curves. All right, so if women were the arbiters of taste and style, then perhaps the most important woman, the most important arbiter, the, the influencer uh, of the Rococo period was this woman, Madame de Pompadour. She was known as Renette to her friends, and she was the official mistress of Louis XV and much beloved by many people at court. And she was really kind of the emblem of grace and style of the Rococo period. She was a patron of the decorative arts and of French intellectuals and philosophes like Voltaire. Uh, she oversaw new construction at several royal palaces. She redesigned the gardens at Versailles. She was actually instrumental in the foundation of the Sevres porcelain factory. And she helped to make Paris the center of European taste and style. She was a favorite subject of many painters of the day. And this painting by Francois Boucher is no exception to that. And you can see in it many key elements of 18th century women's fashion. So what do we see? Well, if you look closely, you can see that her dress is not one piece. And then in fact, it's open, that you're actually seeing through to the underskirt, which is the same color and fabric as the sort of jacket piece that goes over her shoulders and arms and around the back of the dress. You can also see all of those pink ribbons in front. They're attached to a piece called the stomacher, which was a triangular piece that went over the corset. And the whole point was to see the lacing of the dress. And sometimes this might be laced with cord, but in this case, of course, it's ribbons that are tied into a bow. And it alludes to the corset underneath because if you can tie a bow, you can also untie a bow. Now, men's clothing in this period had a rather slim silhouette. It was very elegant. The opposite was generally true of women's clothing, which used various different kinds of undergarments to create truly amazing shapes. And we're gonna talk about the shape of women's dresses and how they got those shapes. But before we talk about that, we should talk about something that was a sort of uniquely French style of dress, or I should say undress of this period. The déshabillé, the graceful undress, and the ritual known as la toilette. So this idea of la toilette, it's a morning ritual, originally, taken from the lay, the time when the king would wake up and be attended by courtiers, but instead of kings, now you suddenly had a woman that was the centerpiece of this ritual. In her déshabillé, her gracious undress, and she would receive visitors while slowly getting dressed and preparing for the day. Now, no one should think this was an 8 a.m. call. This was usually around 11, 11.30, maybe noon. And she would be wearing an outfit that was purposely designed for this occasion which is a really modern idea. It's a little like loungewear or athleisure wear, pretty much what all of us have been doing in our Zoom meetings for this past several months, right? And so she would be wearing her chemise, which would be the sort of simple white gown underneath. She'd be wearing her stays or what most people would think of as her corset. 
And then there would be a peignoir over the top, a sort of beautifully thrown over as though to suggest something very casual, but it was a very, very uh, pointed effort. And it, while she was déshabillée, she would be doing her toilette. And there are lots of uh, different things that she would be doing while she was getting made up and ready for her day. So she could, for instance, receive a visit from her dressmaker. The woman uh, who is on the ground here is not actually a maid. She's not putting on shoes or anything. She is a marchand de mode, a French dressmaker or a seller of fashion items. And she has brought her sample books and sample ribbons and things to show to the lady of the house, uh, making a little sale before lunch. A woman could also receive male visitors like her husband who probably had his own bedroom or other men who lived in the house and she would receive them in her gracious des habits. She could also receive her lover uh, and conduct a little affair on the side, probably with her maid right there helping her get dressed. Or if she wanted to engage in a little social networking and intellectual life, she could have famous people play, both for the woman herself. And you can think about the idea. She's getting herself together. She's got this beautiful dressing table in front with lots of little bottles of perfume and makeup. And you can imagine that she, as she casually reaches for a brush or a bottle of perfume, it reveals a wrist, a beautiful bit of the forearm, whatever. So it's a chance to show off her grace, her elegance, a little bit of herself. Also a chance to show off her taste and her personal possessions, her sense of style. But it, it wasn't about vanity. More than anything, La Toilette was an important social occasion. It was a chance to network and to make important connections. It was said, and I quote, a charming woman uses more subtlety and politics in her dressing than there all are in all the governments of Europe. And even the furniture of the day was designed for this ritual. This is a wonderful fauteuil à coiffe, a dressing chair. And the reason the back of it has that big curve or divot is so that the woman's hair was easily accessible to her lady's maid who was doing her hairstyle, but also so that her neck and maybe even the top of her shoulders would be easily visible to whoever was watching her. And it would have been thought to be very gracious and beautiful. All right, now once a woman actually began to dress, there are a number of pieces that she would put on that would allow her to create the amazing silhouettes that we associate with this time period. And to show you that, we actually have a little video. All right, many thanks to Heather Lesseur for modeling the clothes and actually making some of them, uh, to Kayla Hickok for helping her dress and to Scott Ahrens for doing our filming and video editing. And he's actually my stage manager for this little event today. Okay, a couple of things to note. Many of the pieces of undergarments that make up the silhouette of, of the 18th century, there are lots of them, right? So here are more examples of a pannier. Uh, the pannier is the basket-shaped petticoat with whalebone stays in it that would help the dress maintain its shape. So the good thing about a pannier is it freed the legs from lots of petticoats. You can imagine that to make one of these extraordinary shapes, you would have needed lots and lots and lots of fabric. But the pannier, by using its whalebone stays, would have created more freedom of movement in some ways. But of course, now a woman is negotiating all of this other stuff as she tries to move through space. And this allowed for almost ridiculous shapes in clothing. There is one silver dress in particular I would like to show you. There we are. So you can just imagine if you are the woman who is wearing this, it's very impressive, but it's hard to move around. And in a magazine in 1770, in 1717, it was said, what skill and management is required to reduce one of these circles within the limits of a chair? And what precautions must a modest female take even to enter the doors of a private family without obstruction? I have seen many fine ladies who, when they sail in their hoops about an apartment, look like children in go-karts. You can imagine how hard it was in those tiny, pretty little 18th century chairs 
to get anywhere near one in a dress like this. The second takeaway is that women could not get dressed on their own. It took staff and it took money. Once a woman had all of the foundation garments in place, it was time to actually put on the dress. And the prevailing style was called the robe a la Française. Dresses were made up of different pieces and they were not dresses as we would think of them, a one piece thing that you maybe put over your head and do up in the back. They were complicated to put together. And so the first piece would have been a stomacher. It's triangular and it would go over the corset or the stays. And then the, the bodice would lace over this, or if you remember in that picture of Madame de Pompadour, it could have ribbons that are tied into bows. The actual, what we would think of as the dress itself then, would go over this. And it has, in this style, the robe a la Française, an open robe. So we will show you a picture of that. And the whole point of this is that you could see the petticoat in front. So in both of these examples, you can see that the petticoat or the underdress in this uh, image, it's made of the same material and it's the same color, right? But there's something really alluring about the idea that the dress isn't closed in front, that it's open somehow. Um, it was considered very elegant and it's part of the sensuality of the day. This was a period where there were wonderful new fabrics and things out of which one could make a dress or with which one could decorate a dress. So you had printed cottons, you had silk, damask, lace, chiffon, lots and lots of surface decoration because dresses themselves, the fabrics were very expensive and very hard to clean. So it was easier in some ways to change the trimmings and try to make dresses look new or revive them a a little, you could change your trimmings with the season. And I think always with these clothes, there is an eroticism. There is an alluding to what is underneath all of these layers. Okay, so really, what does it all mean? Why does all of this dress frou-frou matter to, to France and ultimately to a piece like Manon? Well, the first takeaway is that fashion was big business in France. By 1760, the French ruled fashion throughout Europe. And the idea of Paris as the center of the fashion world, that's actually an 18th century idea. Fashion became a major economic driver of the French economy, and of course, it still is today. And if we look again at this painting by Boucher, we have a new appreciation of the little marchand des modes with her sample books showing her client the latest trimmings. So a sample book would have been books like these. These are actual 18th century sample books where you would have bits of fabric, lace, trimmings, cottons, all sorts of things from all over the world. France had huge trade in all of these things at this point. And you could bring these to your client, perhaps as she is doing her morning toilette and show her all of the latest things that she could order from your shop or that you would procure for her to trim her dress. This period also saw the rise of the first fashion designers, the, the women who were actually making a business to not only put things together at the instructions of a bourgeois or noble client, but actually designed them. And none more so than this woman. Her name was Rose Bertin. She was from middle-class origins, but in 1770, she opened a fashion design business called the Grand Mogul. And she became the most famous stylist and dressmaker in Paris. She was Marie Antoinette's dressmaker. And we still have some examples of Rose Bertin designs. You can see in the two dresses, that are pulled up in the back. This is a slightly later style, um, similar to a robe à la polonaise, where you take the overskirt and actually pull it up. It actually reveals more of an underskirt or petticoat, so it's even more revealing. Um, and they're quite beautiful. You can see the elegance of uh, the true design eye that Rose Bertin uh, brought to everything. All right, so as I said, needless to say, this fashion took a lot of money. And that come, brings us to takeaway number two. In this period, a woman was what she wore and her face was her fortune. Rococo society valued everything that was fresh and new. It prized youth and beauty above almost everything else. 30 was considered old middle age for a woman. And there was a real brutality in this society about women who dressed too young, if you didn't have the appropriate trimmings or the appropriate dress style or fabrics for your age. So the window of time in which a woman could make an oppression was very, very small. This was a world that was licentious. It was frivolous. It was very energetic and ultimately doomed. 
And those are the realities of Manon's world. Women were at the center, but they better look good and have the right dress, and that took cash. Takeaway number three, the 18th century is still with us. These are designs by Vivian Westwood, um, Christian Lacroix, uh, Alexander McQueen, Jean-Paul Gaultier. And even Vogue gets into the spirit of the 18th century and the Rococo and how much it interests us and continues to inspire fashion of our day. It reminds us that it's never too late to rock the Rococo. All right. The Rococo was a time of sheer delight for the senses, and you could see it in the art, in the decoration of rooms, the furniture, and most especially in the wonderfully sensual and very expensive clothing of women. And on the surface, this may seem frivolous, and so might Manon as a character. But the stakes were really high, and a smart woman understood that clothing made her who she was and who she aspired to be. Now, since I know you will all be joining us on Sunday for our live watch party for the broadcast of Manon, I want to tell you just a little bit about how what I've just talked about will be reflected in what you'll actually see on the stage. So first, the costumes. Well, in Act One, Manon actually comments on the boring dress that she's wearing compared with the dresses of the characters that I like to call the Ets, uh, Rosette, Poussette, and Javotte three beautiful young women that are highly dressed in very appropriate robe à la française. And Manon sees them and sings about how beautiful what they're wearing is. And she intrinsically understands somehow that their beauty is amplified by what they're wearing. In act two of the production, you'll actually see Manon in her déshabillé, in her gracious undress. She's wearing a wonderful gold peignoir. And she's perfectly happy to receive visitors in it. Her cousin Lesko comes and brings a friend that turns out to be Bretigny in disguise. Um, and she she thinks pain of the idea of basically receiving men in her pajamas uh, because she looks so good and Sydney does look really awesome in it. In act three, you will see her in the world's most elegant gold dress. It is the epitome of style. It has very clean cut lines, uh, which is actually a little unusual for Rococo design, but it sort of leans forward in design in a way that I personally find very appealing. And in act four, you will see her in a really over the top red dress that actually evokes that, that silver job we saw earlier. Um, and that really kind of tracks her rise up the scale. And it's, it's no wonder that from there, there's only one direction to go and that's down. The second thing you're gonna see reflected is the color palette. So I talked a little bit about how pastels were sort of iconic of the Rococo period, and you will see a lot of that in the production, in the clothing, both of men and women, and also reflected in the set. Quite a lot of the set has this lovely light green color to it that I think is very evocative of art of the Rococo period. And thirdly, you will also see it reflected in the set design. Now, there are some tall towers that are part of the set. They're based on a Greek idea called periactoi, or towers that turn. In this, panels in these towers turn, and that idea comes from French uh, folded screens, which were very, very popular during this period. You might have a very elegant screen in your, uh, in your dressing room or even in your salon um, that would be painted, with, for instance, with a countryside scene or something like that. But more than anything, what you're gonna notice about the scenery is the curve of the steps. I remember Keith Brumley, our scenic designer, said that this was the, the curviest set he'd ever done, that there were fewer straight lines in the Manon set uh, of anything that, that we had done at DMMO. And it's true, we did that purposely. We tried to create a space that evoked the feminine of the Rococo. All right, so oh, that is a little bit about how 18th century design factors into Manon, and specifically about how clothing tells us a little bit about what was important in this society, the aesthetics, uh, and how it caused women to make certain kinds of choices in this period. And I think now we will go to questions. All right, so I have a question that says, can you tell us about where the costumes from Sunday's broadcast came from? There were so many costumes and wigs in that production and so many quick costume changes. And this question actually comes from Brian August, who was our stage manager for Manon and for, I think, almost every show I've done at DMMO. Um, yes, so the costumes were actually borrowed from Opera Australia, and then we put some other things in the package. So we shipped them a long way, and they were worth it. 
Um, there were lots of clothes. Manon had five dresses in the production and five wigs. And because of the way we broke up the production, combining acts one and two, both scenes of act three, and then acts four and five, it actually led to some costume quick changes. And you can imagine from what I've just showed you with all of these undergarments and everything that goes into 18th century Roba La Francaise, that doing a costume quick change in this period was no joke. And I'm pretty sure we made them all, but it was a, it was a big deal. And it took a lot of uh, planning and careful forethought uh, in a way we're used to just being able to sort of rip everything off in the wings and, and get to the new thing. And that's not something you can do when you are dealing with 18th century clothes. Uh, if I was asked to conceive a production of Manon set in modern times, how would you go about that? Does this piece lend itself to adaptation? I think it does. I mean, I think that women are still judged very much by what they wear. And even if you didn't want to set it exactly contemporaneously, you could think of other periods that would be very, very interesting to think about that. Maybe the 1920s or the 1950s. Um, the elegance of the 1950s would actually be really fascinating to explore because coming out of World War II, you have a lot of resurgence of French design that feels like it could tap into a lot of the, the spirit of the new energy of the Rococo. And so that might be a really interesting direction to go. It isn't the direction we chose to go when we did this production, but who knows, maybe that'll be my next production of Manon. Um, okay, so we have a question that says, how do the singers get used to performing in costumes like this? It seems like it would be very difficult moving in skirts that wide. Absolutely true. Um, we practiced with the pannier in rehearsal. So all the principals had their, their baskets, their pannier, and the petticoats that went over them in rehearsal all the time. Um, we didn't actually rehearse with the corsets in rehearsal down in the rehearsal room. We waited until we were on stage and had proper dressers to, to do that. But it was very important, even just for spacing, to have all of that because women can't stand right next to each other in this period. And if you're the tenor, if you're Joe Dennis and you're trying to kiss Sydney, there's a lot of dress between you and that soprano that you have to learn to negotiate. So those were all things we had to learn how to do and do them in a way that felt really natural. You know, one of the things is that to us, they are costumes, but of course to these people, they were clothes. To Manon, this is her world. And so everyone had to have a kind of casualness about them. They didn't want the clothes to wear the singer. The singer has to wear the clothes. And one of the ways that I tried to help everybody recognize how people would have moved and um, what they would have done, how they would have comported themselves in the clothing was through the use of art. Uh, we had tons of printouts of pictures of 18th century art in the rehearsal room. We actually made huge collages all over the walls. And the first course rehearsal, I pointed them out to everybody and I said, you know, study these pictures and see if you can come to terms with how you might make that gesture, how you might find that pose for yourself. I'm not trying to impose anything on anyone's physicality or, or their interpretation of character, but see how you can use this kind of elegance to tell the story of these people, of your character and of the clothing itself. And it's funny because I always fill the rehearsal hall with lots of imagery. On the first break, of course, first chorus rehearsal, everybody, like the wall was crowded. It was a block of people just staring at the artwork. And I thought that was great, that it really gave them a window into the idea that they needed to internalize these clothes. Um, were there challenges navigating the set pieces with these elaborate costumes? Well, yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, if you're a woman wearing a pannier and a huge dress over it, you can't see your feet. And that's hard going up and down stairs. And there were a fair number of stairs on the set. So, you know, when Sydney makes her grand entrance into Act Three, you'll see in the production that she gets to the top of the stairs. She did a wonderful twirl. And then, in order to come down, gentlemen would offer their hands. Now, a gentleman graciously dressed, offering his hand to a lady is perfectly appropriate to the period, and everybody wanted to offer their hands to Sydney, so that was fine. Um, but it was also completely necessary because I think otherwise she might have gone down the stairs. It's not a period where you can move quickly, and yet Sydney figured it out. In act one, she was zipping around that set like nobody's business. But it did make us have to rethink. I often take for granted um, what people can do and, and not do. And I myself, I'm usually all over the floor and wearing jeans to rehearsal. And that 
is not so useful in this context. We really had to be thoughtful about it. That said, it was really important to me that people push it to the limit of what we thought was possible in the clothing, because I think 18th century people would have. And if you've ever seen the movie Dangerous Liaisons, the one with Uma Thurman and John Malkovich, um, what I think is particularly instructive in that film is the way that John Malkovich sits backward and sideways over every chair, always. He doesn't care about the clothes. And I can imagine the wardrobe department on that film was probably angry at him all the time because they would have cared a lot about those costumes, which were very expensive. But I'm sure if you asked him, his point would be, but I'm sure people sat like that in the 18th century. Obviously not in the artwork, right? Not when they're posing formally for a beautiful portrait, which would have been very expensive. But at home, like they put their feet on the couch like we do. And so it was important to me that we also feel the freedom to move in that way. All right, so other questions. What else can I tell you about the production? It was great actually having period clothing. It's something that I don't get to do that often anymore. Having moved into new American opera, uh, we do much less of that sort of thing. Um, and there's a real uh, graciousness about this clothing, but it also makes you think about the constrictions. And of course, constricting the body is also to some extent constricting the spirit. And Manon constantly pushing against the boundaries of her society. It's really interesting to think about in the context of her wearing a corset and all of that clothing. And of course, she's desperate for it because it's how she indicates that she's arrived in society. Um, but at the same time, she's freest. And I think you'll see it in this production, too. She's freest in act two when that wearing that penoir, you know, it feels very modern. I mean, it's any woman in her pajamas and her robe at home flopping on the bed. And we really tried to find that contrast of what it is to be at home in your body and in this clothing. All right, um, our patrons associate you most with contemporary pieces like Wozzeck, Dead Man Walking, Soldier Songs, and Flight, to name a few. Do you enjoy directing traditional grand operas like Manon? When I have a cast like this one, yes. <laughs> um, you know, it's a double-edged sword and I have to women are portrayed in 19th century opera in particular. Um, I choose my, my older pieces carefully. I choose pieces where I feel like I have something to say about the story and specifically about the heroine. Um, you know, chances are if it's a 19th century opera, the woman dies. So I need to find a way into that arc and that journey that I find to be satisfying. I think Manon is a really interesting piece because she is always the subject of the male gaze. And as you saw from all of that artwork and everything I've said about the aesthetics of the period, that is totally what the early 18th century and mid 18th century were about, right? Manon is the object of everybody's gaze. Five different men, principal men, fall in love with Manon the moment they see her. She never has a chance to be away from that kind of attention. I think that's fascinating and I think that's worth exploring. So that kind of uh, thing makes me really interested in doing period work. Another question, um, can you talk about how some of the wigs were meant to be natural looking and others were overly styled like in act four? That is a great question. So um, in the 18th century, you would have had people that still had very formal wigs. Um, white powder wigs, as we call them. And this sort of harkens back to the time of, of Louis XIV. As time progresses in the Rococo period and towards the middle of the 18th century, some of that relaxes. And more natural looking hairstyles and hair comes into fashion. And we tried to reflect that, that especially the younger characters would have more modern hairstyles. Um, the older characters, like a character like Guillaume, is always very hyper styled, right? He would never be seen without white powder because to him as a nobleman, who's always putting his style first, that's really important to him. But very possible that younger characters might not do that. And that you would see much more natural styling that people would have actually used some of their own hair and powdered that. And so we reflected that and you can see that as the show progresses. By the time we get to act four, the really rich and overstyled act, and Manon is wearing the big red dress, she is wearing a very elegant and very beautiful white powder wig. 
which actually looks weirdly sexy on her, I have to say. It, it was a great, great look. And it's amazing how good a woman can, we, we, as women, we often think that white hair will age us. And it's amazing to see a young and beautiful woman in a white wig and realize just how beautiful it is. And in this case, how well it sort of set off the dress and her face. Other questions, other things that I can tell you? Perhaps not. I do hope you will all join us on Sunday. This is a spectacular production and a great one to start off our virtual festival with. I'm really proud of the show. It was lovely to do the cast catch up. That's coming up for all of you tomorrow. So if you tune in tomorrow, you'll get to see all of the major players in the cast and hear about what they've been up to since last we saw them. Uh, that was a great discussion. We, had, we, we taped it. so. We had it a few days ago, but it was really nice to see everybody. Some of those people I've worked with since, some of them I haven't seen since we did Manon uh, and can't wait to work with again. And then on Sunday is the, the broadcast. And if you can't catch us at the watch party or if you don't happen to live in an IPTV area, you will be able to stream it later, which is wonderful. So, so many people uh, who didn't get to see the production originally will be able to see it this time. All right. Well. I think that's it from me. I hope you have enjoyed a little bit of undressing the 18th century. It gives you a greater appreciation of just how much went into getting dressed for a woman of this time period. I think, you know, we've all spent months now in our pajamas and we forget uh, how much it might take to really be a paragon of elegance and style. And in the 18th century, it was just extraordinary what women did to, to show themselves off to their best advantage and what that would have said about their family, their social connections, and their place in Rococo society. All right. Bye from me.